Our speaker today is Dr. David Whitaker, the curator of Mormon and Western Americana in the L. Tom Perry Special Collections. Uh, he also holds a joint uh, appointment in the Department of History, and he comes to the study of Mormon history with a rich spiritual and intellectual background. He earned a, a Bachelor of Arts degree at BYU in 1967 and an MA in the History of the American West at California State University at Northridge in 1973. In 1982, he completed his PhD in history here at BYU. Uh, before returning to BYU in his current capacity, he taught in the church education system, both as an institute instructor and as area director in the, in the Los Angeles, California area. Uh, for the past 30 years or more, the history of the Latter-day Saints has occupied his professional time. His studies have taken him to the Andrew Walls Library at the U University of Edinburgh in Scotland, as a Fulbright Fellow to the Eccles Center for American Studies at the British Library in London, to the American Antiquarian Society in, in Worcester, Massachusetts, to the Beinecke Library at Yale, to the Historical Department of the Church in Salt Lake City, as well as our own repository here. His publications include uh, seven books and at least 78 articles, book chapters, book reviews, encyclopedia entries, and bibliographies, which are of most importance to library work here. Uh, all of this on the history of the Latter-day Saints, as he has published in publications like The Ensign, The Journal of Mormon History, BYU Studies, Western Historical Quarterly, among many others. Few are as well qualified to help us appreciate the life and the words of Joseph Smith. So would you please join me in welcoming our own David Whitaker. I want to begin by giving my share of thanks to those who've worked so hard during the last seven or eight months in pulling together the exhibit you will see in a few minutes. Uh, certainly, Larry Draper has been uh, a full equal partner in all of the work that we've done together as we've planned and described and prepared uh, the exhibit you'll see. Uh, uh, Scott's mentioned those who've worked with on the exhibit and other matters relating to it. We are very grateful for all of their work and time that that takes. I'd like to also express uh, gratitude to Richard Oman, who uh, arranged for us to borrow a few pieces of sculpture uh, of Joseph Smith created by Craig Varner and Stanley Watts. We thank both uh, Richard and the artists. We're grateful to Lewis Crandall. Again, I don't think we can say thanks enough. He's been a delight to work with and has been more than generous in his time and, uh, and in loaning materials that he owns. Grateful for those who've been involved in publicity and grateful friends and family and others who have uh, supported our work. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge, of course, uh, if only in spirit, uh, Chad Flake and Dean Larson, who for many, many years uh, uh, helped build the incredible collections we have here in Special Collections that we've been able to easily draw upon to create the exhibit you're about to see. We're grateful for them. I'm grateful for a long years of friendship with both of them, and both, of course, have passed away, but uh, I just wanted to honor them that way. Finally, I'd like to suggest that we certainly must acknowledge the major scholars of the life and thought of Joseph Smith. It's certainly upon their work that we'll continue to build. There are a number we could mention. Certainly uh, at the top of the list would be people like Dean Jesse, uh, whom I'm drawn on for some of the things I'll say today. Um, he spent a lifetime working on Joseph Smith materials and continues to do so, uh, down to and including people like Richard Bushman, whose most recent biography of the prophet clearly reveals, I think, his own preeminence now in the field of Joseph Smith's study. We will have available, if it's not ready today, a bibliographic guide that I prepared on the uh, manuscript and printed literature on the prophet Joseph Smith. We would use that as a springboard. We hope all of this day will be a springboard into uh, more in-depth and uh, more uh, uh, lengthy studies about our founding prophet. As a research uh, library at a major university, we're delighted to be able to pay our part this year in the celebration of the bicentennial of the birth of Joseph Smith and the 175th anniversary of the founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But of course, an individual whose story is as complex and as interesting as that of the prophet could never really be uh, represented in just one exhibit, no matter how large. We know this, of course, and we've not even tried to do so. But hopefully our exhibit will 
at least complement the church's own exhibit, which has been up for much of the year uh, in the Museum of Art in Salt Lake City. What we have tried to do is present an overview of his life by gathering some of our rare and important manuscripts and printed items to illustrate, of course, the foundational period of the church. We've woven several themes through the exhibit. Obviously, the sacred volumes of scripture that Joseph Smith gave to the world constitute a key theme, as they were, of course, in his own life. You will see the earliest extant manuscript of the earliest known revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith and recorded by Oliver Cowdery. Uh, we have, of course, again, with the assistance of Lewis Crandall, recreated a part of the printing shop that gave topograph uh, typographical birth to the Book of Mormon. But other threads of our exhibit tapestry would be his family heritage, temples, missionary work, uh, the gathering, and, of course, the tragedy of his martyrdom. Hopefully, you will find your own threads as you experience the exhibit. The exhibit will be up through next April. We hope you'll return often. I would like to make note, however, today that uh, on the second Wednesday of each month, beginning at uh, 3 o'clock from January to April, we have invited four LDS scholars to speak on various aspects of Joseph Smith's life. Richard L. Anderson will begin our series in, April, in uh, January speaking about the Smith family heritage and its background to Joseph Smith's own uh, quest for religious experiences. Uh, Jill Mulvey-Dur will speak in February on women and the early church and their uh, discipleship. James Allen will speak the next month on Joseph Smith's presidential campaign and the role of states' rights and other such issues in Joseph's uh, discussions and letters with people like John C. Calhoun. And finally, Ronald K. Esplin will address uh, Joseph's relationship with Brigham Young and the nature of discipleship in that relationship. So all of these are meant to complement and expand and uh, provide uh, additional depth to our exhibit on the Prophet Joseph. But most of all, we hope we have provided a space in which you can reflect on and ponder about our Prophet. To remember, I think, is almost a sacramental thing with us Latter-day Saints. While we cannot remember everything, we must not forget the important things. Like Alma, when he was counseling his son Helaman about sacred records, quote, it is wisdom that these things should be preserved for they have enlarged the memory of this people. We, at the heart of our work, hope that our work will assist you in enlarging your memory of the Prophet Joseph and, beyond that, the history of the Restoration itself. Such a task, we would suggest, lies at the heart of the work of the L. Tom Perry Special Collections Library here at BYU. What brings us together today is the great mission and testimony of Joseph Smith that the heavens were again open and that all people were invited to be part of this new dispensation. Joseph's visions, his leadership, and his faithfulness to his divine calling, all of these are at the core of our heritage and, of course, our continuing message to the world. Moroni had told young Joseph in 1823 that his name would be had for good and evil throughout the world, and twice it was hinted in the earliest revelations that he might die a violent death. In section five, quote, be firm in keeping the commandments wherewith I have commanded you. And if you do this, behold, I will grant unto you eternal life, even if you should be slain. In section six, blessed are ye if they reject your message, for they can do no more unto you than unto me. And even if they do unto you as they have done unto me, Blessed are ye, for ye shall dwell with me in glory. Often thought what internal meditation that caused in the prophet's young life as he was just getting uh, the whole business of the restoration underway. In one of the most solemn and, I think, difficult times of his own life, when many friends had come to question his calling and leadership, and when even he wondered out loud where God was when the people who had followed him were being driven during the winter of 1838 and 39 from the state of Missouri, the spirit whispered assurances to him. This is in section 121. The ends of the earth shall inquire after thy name, and fools shall have thee in derision, and hell shall rage against thee, while the pure in heart, and the wise, and the noble, and the virtuous shall seek counsel, and authority, and blessings constantly from under thy hand." End quote. To those of us who hold steadfast to the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he was called to restore, and of the church he established in 1830, we still seek counsel and blessings from him. 
How can we do this today? Surely the revelations he gave to the world are one of the most important avenues, and of course, the priesthood authority he brought to the earth is another. But what else is there? Where can we go to more fully study the life and teachings of our founding prophet? We would do well, I would suggest, to remember in our study of Joseph Smith a kind of disclaimer that Mark Twain gave readers in the preface to his autobiography written late in his life. Quote, what a wee part of a person's life are his acts and his words. His real life is led in his head and is, not, and is known to none but himself. All day long and every day the mill of his brain is grinding and his thoughts, not those other things, are his history. His acts and his words are merely the visible thin crust of his world with its scattered snow summits and its vacant wastes of water and they are so trifling a part of his bulk, a mere skin enveloping it. The mass of him is hidden. It and its volcanic fires that toss and boil and never rest day or night. These are his life, and they are not written and cannot be written. Every day would make a whole book of 80,000 words, 365 books a year. Biographies are but the clothes and buttons of the man. The biography of the man himself cannot be written. End quote. That reminds us of that last conference address of Joseph, No Man Knows My History. Was he thinking in the same terms that Mark Twain would think at all those years later? We'll reflect on that. As we celebrate Joseph Smith's 200th birthday this month, we seek to learn more and more about from him and about him. The First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles share these feelings, and as part of their efforts to make the records of Joseph Smith's life and presidency more available to all, they have given their approval for the preparation of a multi-volume edition of the papers of Joseph Smith. To be edited by a team of LDS scholars, the project will contain Joseph Smith's journals, personal history, correspondence, revelations, sermons, legal papers, and related materials. Its final approval, of course, will be given by a reading committee uh, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, specifically those who were assigned as advisors to the historical department of the church. Currently, the papers have been organized into four sub-series. One, the journals. Two, papers, which broadly defined will contain the correspondence, the revelations, and the sermons. Three, Joseph Smith's history. And four, his legal documents. Each series is planned to be chronologically arranged, and it is anticipated that the project will eventually reach about 30 or more volumes. When finished, the papers of Joseph Smith will serve as the foundational documents of Joseph Smith's life, teachings, and presidency. It will be for Mormon history what the papers of Thomas Jefferson are for American history, bedrock texts to which all students will turn for, trust, for a trustworthy record for both the person and the events of his life. As one of the editors on this project, I would like to talk to you about today about this project by describing some of the main categories of the records of his life. First, the journals. There are in the church archives 10 volumes containing the journals of Joseph Smith. They comprise 1,587 pages in manuscript, but of these pages, only 31 contain the actual holographic or personal writing of Joseph Smith himself and only about 250 additional pages can we be sure were probably dictated by the prophet to scribes. That means the remaining 1,306 pages, or about 80% of the total entries in his journals, were primarily the work of four men whom Joseph appointed to keep his journals for him, mainly James Mulholland, George W. Robinson, William Clayton, and Willard Richards. Such a practice was common at the time among men of leadership, but it does not mean that, but it does, but it does mean that much of the content of the prophet's journals are the products of other men's hands and minds, thus one step removed from the prophet himself. And the total number of days that could have been that could have contained entries from the 27th of November 1832, when the first general en journal entry was made until just a few days before the prophet's martyrdom on the 27th of June, 1844, there were a total of 4,229 days lived. But the extant journals contain entries for only 1,228 days, or about 25% of the total number of days lived, thus leaving for 
our study, large gaps in the prophet's daily record. Uh, a subject we'll talk about further. The second area are the sermons and discourses. The prophecy in 2 Nephi chapter 3, verses 6 through 18, foretells of Joseph Smith's work. In verse 17, speaking of the choice seer to be raised up in the last days, the Lord said, quote, I will raise up a Moses and will give him power unto him in a rod and will give him judge, a judgment unto him in writing. Yet I will not loose his tongue that he, will, that he shall speak much, for I will not make him mighty in speaking. End quote. Those who heard the prophet speak wrote of his uneducated manner, but suggested he possessed, quote, the gift of rough eloquence, unquote. Lorenzo Snow said he could not call Joseph Smith a fluent speaker, but those who stayed to listen to the prophet heard through his sermons, his heart, his mind, and spirit communicating important truths. He, of course, often assigned others to speak at church meetings in the earliest days of the church. They were Oliver Cowdery and Sidney Rigdon that we all know about. But Joseph spoke too, and we are the richer for the surviving accounts. But just what records do we have of the prophet's sermons? Dean Jesse summarized the challenges in dealing with the records of the public discourses of Joseph Smith, and I quote Dean's uh, study uh, of 1991. Quote, during the last 18 months of his life, the prophet is known to have given 78 public addresses, or an average of a little more than one per week. Assuming conservatively that he averaged 30 speeches a year during the earlier years, the total discourses of his public ministry, that is from 1830 to 1844, would number about 450. But available sources identify only about 250 of those discourses and his published history gives reasonably adequate summaries of only about one-fifth of these. Not until the last 18 months of his life were the prophet's speeches recorded with any reasonable consistency. Of the 52 discourses reported in some detail in his history, 35 date from that period. The remaining 17 average about two a year between 1834 and 1842. These figures suggest, uh, Brother Jesse concludes, not more than one in 10 of Joseph Smith's discourses were recorded, and most of those come from the last three years of his life." End quote. Of the 52 extant reports, Willard Richards and Wilford Woodruff recorded 40 of them. Those who reported Joseph Smith's speeches, of course, did not know shorthand. It was just sort of invented in 1839, the same year as photography. Thus, to record the comments of a speaker was a slow process and clearly an incomplete one. Brigham Young learned this lesson. Brigham would gather around him scribes that knew shorthand and followed him everywhere. We have in the church archives over a thousand full text discourses of Brother Brigham, uh, of only which about 360 were ever printed in the Journal of Discourses. So there's a lot more uh, because Brigham learned to have scribes who knew shorthand around him. If we were to follow, however, this slower process for one of Joseph Smith's most famous sermons, the King Follett Discourse, his uh, last general conference address on 7 April 1844, you would see what I mean. Joseph Smith spoke, according to contemporary observers, for about two and a fourth hours. We have the rough notes from nine recorders or reporters of that sermon, but the bulk of what we have was recorded by Wilford Woodruff, Willard Richards, Thomas Bullock, William and William Clayton, whose individual reportage was afterwards combined to produce a single text. But this even, but even this probably only gives us about one half of what the prophet himself said in his last general conference address. We're grateful for that, but boy do we wish we had more. We wish others had recorded more details of what they tell us they did hear the prophet talking about. For example, in a letter to his wife Sally, William W. Phelps wrote on the 2nd of June of 1835 of hearing the prophet speak in Kirtland, Ohio for three and a half hours on the topic, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. No doubt on the first vision. But Phelps didn't write one single word of what the prophet said. Parley P. Pratt, another contemporary and, and of course apostle, left two tantalizing accounts. 
He wrote to members of the church in Canada in, on the 27th of November, 1836, of a meeting he had recently attended in Kirtland. And I quote, this letter is, is in the John Taylor papers at the church archives. It's Parley Pratt's letter to uh, the elders and brethren of the church in Canada. Quote, one week before the meeting, word was publicly given that Brother J. Smith Jr. would give a, a relating of the coming forth of the records and also the rise of the church and of his experience. Accordingly, a vast concourse assembled at the early hour. Every seat was crowded, and four or five hundred people stood up in the aisles. Brother Smith gave the history of these things, relating many particularly of the manner of his first visions, etc. Spirit and power of God was upon him and bearing testimony, insomuch that many, if not most, of the congregation was in tears. As for myself, I can say that all the reasonings and uncertainty and all the conclusions drawn from the writings of others, however great in themselves, dwindle into insignificance when compared with the living testimony when your eyes and your ears hear from the living oracles of God." Unquote. But he didn't give us any details. Deeply impacted uh, Elder Pratt, but we don't have the details. Three years later, when he, uh, Orson Pratt, was with, uh, was with uh, Joseph Smith in the Philadelphia area, Orson wrote his brother and says, Parley, you've got to get down here. Joseph is teaching wonderful things. Parley dropped everything in New York, came south. Parley wrote in his autobiography, he heard Joseph in Philadelphia in December of 1830, quote, he spoke in great power, bearing testimony of the visions he had seen, the ministering of angels which he enjoyed, and how he had found the plates of the Book of Mormon and translated them by the gift and power of God. The entire congregation was astounded, electrified, a new word entering American vocabulary, as it were, and overwhelmed with a sense of truth and power by which he spoke and the wonders which he related. Period. What did he say? <laughs> we just get hints. All of these examples, we get hints, we get topics, but unfortunately, we were left without details. We have on display in the exhibit you're going to see the notebook that we own of uh, the notebook journal of William Patterson McIntyre, a tailor in Nauvoo who, in fact, measured Joseph Smith and others for suits, which he records in his notebooks we have, but also as a humble tailor, he went to hear Joseph Smith talk and wrote what he heard. So we're, we have a few of those kinds of records where just members of the church who love the prophet went and wrote down what they heard him say. Often it's in longhand and we don't get it all, but you'll see his journal open to one such sermon he heard Joseph Smith give in 1840. There are, of course, other indirect ways of getting at the prophet's sermons. Uh, for example, when Joseph went to Washington, D.C. in 1839 and 40 to seek redress for the Missouri losses and to meet with President, the U.S. President Martin Van Buren, the scribe assigned to keep Joseph Smith's journal failed to do so. So we don't have a good record in Joseph's own uh, journal of that. But we have found several contemporary newspaper reports that report Joseph Smith preaching there. And we also have, of course, publications of key Latter-day Saints who heard Joseph Smith speak and then went off and published a pamphlet dealing with some aspect of the prophet's life or thought. One could, of course, get insights into the kinds of things the prophet is preaching by looking at Samuel Bennett's spring 1840 pamphlet, a very rare pamphlet called A Few Remarks by Way of Reply to an Anonymous Scribbler, uh, where he talks about God having a physical body like his children and hints that Mormons believe that eternal, that marriage can be eternal. Is Joseph beginning to open up more about these key doctrines that he will really preach more openly and reveal more information on during the Nauvoo period? Benjamin Winchester, the church leader in Philadelphia, published a pamphlet in 1840, An Examination of a Lecture by Reverend Henry Perkins. There, for the first time in Mormon literature, is a hint, at least a detailed hint, of a belief in a premortal existence. <clears throat> excuse me, premortal existence. Parley P. Pratt, we've just mentioned, uh, returned to New York and published The Millennium and Other Poems, to which is attached a treatise on the eternal nature and regeneration of matter. The elements, Parley argued, were eternal. They were not created out of nothing. He printed that when he went on his British mission with the other members of the Quorum of the Twelve as a pamphlet called The World Turned Upside Down. And we know that it was clearly influential on his brother Orson's more famously known track, The Absurdities of Immaterialism. But here we have strong indirect evidence 
that Joseph was preaching on those things during that important trip to the East Coast. And of course, finally, we have Parley's brother Orson, who with his uh, apostolic assignment in England was assigned to Scotland, and in September of 1840 in Edinburgh, published his very important and interesting account of several remarkable visions, wherein, for the first time in print, appears an account of Joseph Smith's first vision, 20 years after it happened. Now, we, we have manuscript accounts of it as early as 1832, but where it's printed, you don't get it until you uh, see Orson Pratt's Edinburgh, Scotland pamphlet, um, a very important first in Mormon literature. But where does he get that information? Parley and Orson, I am convinced, had heard Joseph more openly talk about that sacred experience during his time in the East Coast. Three, revelations. There are about a hundred extant manuscripts of revelations received through the prophet Joseph Smith that were printed in what we know as the Doctrine and Covenants. Of course, in addition to the Book of Mormon, the Book of Moses, which of course includes material from the Book of Enoch and the Book of Adam. We also know of the Book of Abraham, as well as Joseph Smith's rev other revisions to the biblical text. All of those date from July 1828 to November 1843. But there are, in addition to the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, we now know of about 60 additional revelations, of which we have texts for about 30 of them. So the total number that we know about is about 170. Those we plan to include in the larger uh, papers of Joseph Smith. We remember uh, that in section five, which we have the original manuscript of on display, that this generation, the Lord told the early church, shall have my word through you. And the day the church was organized, the church was told, the church shall give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. Well, if we had time, we could pursue that uh, more and more, but we'll go on to number four, correspondence. We know of approximately 1,500 letters written either to or from Joseph Smith that we anticipate will be included in the Joseph Smith Papers project. These letters cover the prophet's whole ministry and treat just about every conceivable subject, but few, I would suggest to you, are ordinary. Joseph's letters, when you study them, convey his strength of leadership, his prophetic mantle, his concerns over his family, as well as his people. A few, of course, were included or excerpted into the Doctrine and Covenants, but even here one has excerpts, and from my point of view, some of the best material might have been left out when Orson Pratt included uh, uh, this particular letter in the 1876 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. Here, of course, I speak of that magnificent Liberty Jail letter, which we know as sections 121 to 123. But the material left out includes, and it's been in the history of the church, but it's not in the Doctrine and Covenants. Should, this material I'm going to quote to you should come right after verse 25 of section 122. Quote, a fanciful and a flowery and heated imagination be aware of, because the things of God are of deep import, and time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. Thy mind, O man, if thou wilt lead a soul into salvation, must search as high as the utmost heavens, and search into and contemplate the lowest considerations of the darkest abyss, and expand up to the broad considerations of, eternal, of the eternal expanse, he must commune with God. How much more dignified and noble are the thoughts of God than the vain imaginations of the human heart. None but fools will trifle with the souls of men. That is inspired uh, revelation, I think. There are other examples, of course, in which we will include, including some of Joseph's more private letters to Emma, his wife. Let me share a few of those, or parts of those. On the 6th of June, 1832, he wrote from Grenville, Indiana, a letter uh, to his wife. The prophet was tending to Newell K. Whitney, who had broken his leg on the return journey from Missouri to Kirtland. I think it gives insights into both the prophet's deep religious life, as well as to his genuine but clearly human feelings for Emma. Quote, my situation is a very unpleasant one, although I try to be contented, the Lord assisting me. I have visited a grove which is just back of the town almost every day, which can be secluded, which I can be secluded from the eyes of any mortal. Sounds like what he did in 1820, doesn't it? And there give vent to all the feelings of my heart in meditation and prayer. I have called to mind all the past moments of my life 
and am left to mourn and shed tears of sorrow for my folly in suffering the adversary of my soul to have so much power over me as he has had in times past. But God is merciful and has forgiven my sins, and I rejoice that he sendeth forth the Comforter unto as many as believe and humble themselves before him. Sister Whitney wrote a letter to her husband, which was very cheering. And I, being unwell at the time and filled with much anxiety, it would have been very consoling to me to have received a few lines from you. But as you did not take the trouble, I will try to be contented with my lot, knowing that God is my friend, and in him I shall find comfort. I have given my life into his hands. I am prepared to go at his call. I desire to be with Christ. I count not my life dear to me, but only to do his will. And then I think he realized that maybe he had been a little tough on Emma. Please forgive my warmth of feeling and also my inability to convey my ideas in writing. Major insight. A few months later, he would write a letter to W.W. Phelps in which he would lament, quote, O oh Lord, deliver us in due time from the little narrow prison, almost as it were total darkness of pen, paper, and ink, and a crooked, broken, scattered, and imperfect language. You see a prophet struggling to express himself in ways that he just didn't uh, always have the ability. In 1838, he wrote another letter to Emma, just at the beginning of the Court of Inquiry. Uh, he and his fellow prisoners were involved in, My dear Emma, we are prisoners in chains and under strong guard for Christ's sake and not for another cause. Although there has been things that were unbeknown to us and altogether beyond our control that might seem to the mob to be a pretext for them to persecute us, but on examination, I think that the authorities will discover our innocence and set us free. But if this blessing cannot be obtained, I have the consolation that I am an innocent man. Let what will befall me. I received your letter, which I read over and over again. It was a sweet morsel to me. Oh, God, grant that I may have the privilege of seeing once more my lovely family. In the enjoyment of the sweets of liberty and social life, to press them to my bosom, kissing their lovely cheeks would fill my heart with unspeakable gratitude. Tell the children I am alive, and trust I shall come and see them before long. Comfort their hearts all you can, and try to be comforted all you can. Oh, my affectionate Emma, I want you to remember that I am a true and faithful friend to you and the children forever. My heart is entwined around yours forever and ever. Oh, may God bless you all. Amen. His, his letters almost become prayers, don't they? A few months later, from Liberty Jail, My dear Emma, I very well know your toils and sympathize with you. If God will spare my life once more to have the privilege of taking, you, taking care of you, I will ease your care and endeavor to comfort your heart. I want you to take the best care of the family you can, which I believe you will do all you can. I was sorry to learn that little Frederick, Frederick was born in 1838, was sick, but I trust he is well again and that you are all well. Write me a long letter and tell me all you can. And even if old Major, of course Joseph Stogg, is alive and yet what those little prattlers that cling around your neck, what they say. I must steer my bark safe, which I intend to do. I want you to do the same, yours forever. Finally, as he's getting ready to come back from Philadelphia, he writes, I am filled with constant anxiety and shall be until I get home. I pray God to spare you all until I get home. My dear Emma, my heart is entwined around you and those little ones. I want you to remember me. Tell all the children that I love them and will be home as soon as I can doesn't sound like the tyrant that you read about in anti-Mormon literature of the period. You get a man whose heart is large and full of love and caring for those closest to him. The fifth thing will be Joseph Smith's history, of course. On the day the church was organized, uh, a revelation received on that day, the very first verse of that revelation instructed, Behold, there shall be a record kept. All the attempts of Joseph Smith to keep records of his own life and of the church he presided over can, I think, be dated from that commandment, section 21 as we know it. Of course, Joseph had learned from his translation of the Book of Mormon the centrality of record keeping, both for the religious lives of his people, of its people, as well as for the perpetuation of civilization itself. In his concern for record keeping, Joseph certainly remembered Alma's counsel to his, of, uh, to his son, Helaman, whom Alma was, of course, uh, transferring the sacred records 
It has hitherto been wisdom in God that these things should be preserved, for behold, they have enlarged the memory of this people. Joseph was concerned about that. When the first Quorum of the Twelve was called in February of 1835, the account of that and Joseph's counsel to them in part is as follows. After a prayer by Joseph Smith, Jr., he said, if we heard patiently, he would lay before the council an item which would be of importance. He had for himself, he said, learned a fact by experience which on recollection always gave him deep sorrow. It is a fact if I had in my possession every decision which had been upon, made upon the important items of doctrines and duties since the commencement of this work, I would not part with them for any sum of money. The church is only five years old. But we have neglected to take minutes of such things, thinking perhaps that they would never benefit us afterwards, which if we had them now would decide almost every point of doctrine that might be agitated. But this has been neglected, and we now cannot bear record to the church or to the world of the great and glorious manifestations which have been made to us with that degree of power and authority we otherwise could if we now had these things to publish abroad. He went on to tell members of the Quorum of the Twelve that they would have the Spirit of the Lord with them proportional to their diligence in keeping records not only of their quorum but of their personal lives. That is, the Spirit, he suggested, would withdraw if they failed to keep records. That Spirit pervades, I think, Joseph Smith's life. He trusted others. We have identified about 26 clerks that worked for Joseph through his life that maintained his history, his journals, and certainly were much benefited from that material. There are other records that we could talk about, records that relate to uh, histories that he had others keep and to, uh, to uh, record. He certainly uh, uh, was involved in a number of initiatives like what is contained in section 123 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the very end of the Liberty Jail letter. Joseph told the early saints that it was an imperative duty they not only owed each other, but to future generations to document the experiences they'd had in Missouri. And out of that grew the early histories we have, the documents, the affidavits that help us understand all the saints went through in that experience. Now let me conclude. In his great, and as it turned out, last general conference address, Joseph said something that should give us all pause who seek the records of his life. You don't know me. You never knew my heart. No man knows my history. I cannot tell it. I shall never undertake it. I don't blame you for not believing my history. If I had not experienced what I have, I could not believe it myself. <laughs> He'd actually said something close to that an entire year before. On April 6, 1843, Joseph said, if I had not actually got into this work and been called of God, I would back out. See the burdens probably bearing down on him. But I cannot back out. I have no doubt of its truth. These sound a little like Mark Twain's disclaimer I think we began with, but I'm grateful that the prophet made the attempts he did to keep institutional records and personal records of the church he founded that he led under inspiration. I'm grateful to be part of a church that has, of course, restored and made available again those great truths to the world. I am grateful to be part of the team, a large team really, that is now preparing what we plan will be the definitive edition of the papers of Joseph Smith. I pray that we can all get better acquainted with this great prophet and be counted among those who, quote, seek counsel, authority, and blessings from under his hand, both from his living legacy, the restoration as we teach, as well as from the written records that document his life and his thought. It is, I think, the hope of the leaders of the Lee Library and certainly all of us who have worked to prepare the exhibit on Joseph Smith that it will further invite you to reflect on the life and legacy of our founding prophet. As President Hinckley reminds us in the very latest December issue of the Ensign, Joseph Smith remains a living presence as the church continues to grow and expand and that we all need to continue to draw strength and guidance from the records and the revelations of our founding prophets. I bear testimony that those things matter, that those are the things we ought not to forget, and I leave you that testimony. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.